You're listening to international investment advisor Doug Goldstein on the Goldstein on Gelt Show, the financial show where we'll talk about how you can make the most of your money. With all the confusing financial chatter bombarding you each and every day, Goldstein on Gelt will give you the practical information you want and need about living a financially stable life. Here's your host, money maven Doug Goldstein. Okay, we are back. I'm very happy to have back on the Goldstein on Geld show, Andre Geim, who's a Russian-born Dutch physicist. He is uh, best known for his last visit on the Goldstein on Geld show, and he spoke to us about the 2010 Nobel Prize he won in physics, along with Constant- Konstantin Novoselov, for their work on graphene. Andre, a pleasure to have you back. Uh, it's my pleasure. I'd actually like to talk today about the gap between academia and industry, and I think we can launch off that by talking about, in fact, the work that you've done on graphene. Um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about that, and then we'll see how that's moving into industry or not. Well, okay. We we were first to introduce to this world graphene. Okay, Graphene is essentially a material which uh, your pencil trace consists of. Uh, uh, you draw a line on a paper, there are some dark flakes, this is graphite, but if you look carefully enough, you will find uh, thinner and thinner flakes, and when you go down to one atomic layer, this would be graphene, okay, so essentially we have found a way uh, of uh, making this one atom thick layers of graphite, and uh, if it would be just rubbish on the surface like a pencil trace, but it turned out that this material has remarkable properties. It's uh, stronger than diamond, it's more conductive than copper, it conducts uh, uh, heat better than anything we know, it's completely impermeable, and it has very good semiconducting properties, and so, so on. So it's sort of a wonder material these days which, promit, uh, which promises myriads of applications and I'm one of those guys who study this material and uh, try to sort of offer this material for industry and uh, for people who know how to use this material for some consumer products. Okay, so we have this fabulous material which you've been working on. In fact, if you look at it on the internet, there are all sorts of videos of what it could potentially be used for. But since you and I spoke probably a couple of years ago already, I actually haven't bought anything that I'm aware of made of graphene. I don't see my cameras or my cars any different. What's the connection now between the work you've done and industry? Uh, Usually, if there is any new material, it takes 40 years before this material materializes in any of consumer products. So take history of plastics, take history of Teflon, take history of silicon or anything else. It's 40 years. You can't really expect that someone uh, finds something and it immediately changes our lives. It's not like a better design or a new gadget which using uh, just a little bit tweaking the software. It's a long term uh, when it goes to hardware. It's a very long term prospect. Okay, so now is that simply, maybe I'm a little bit younger than, than uh, uh, plastic was around since I've been a kid, so I'm not used to the idea that it took a long time to come into development. I'm used to the idea of when you want something, you get it instantly. So it, is it possible that the rate of the, the speeding up of the world simply just doesn't apply in your field? No, it does apply in the field, okay. What I'm uh, saying is that historically it takes a very long time for anything uh, uh, which comes from an academic lab to go to a consumer product. And we generally do not expect anything different for any material. Graphene is a little bit different because it's created a boom or a hype around it. Uh, The developments were extremely quick. Uh, It's no longer only in academic labs, it's already in industrial labs, companies like Nokia, Samsung, uh, spin-offs of IBM plus probably three or four dozens of uh, small, no, probably a few hundreds of different small companies around the world are interested in this material and offer kind of a small product start in niche applications using this product. 
what would you say is generally the reason that we see a, a, a difference or how do industry professionals look differently at these sort of ideas from academic professionals? Uh, there is a big gap. Uh, usually people refer this as a value of death, okay, because uh, if you look at academia, uh, a typical professor has a few PhD students, a couple of postdocs, and so on, and they can produce anything what you can imagine in tiny, small quantities, which usually okay, can be seen under microscope and so on. So we are not different than any of us, okay, thousands of academics, academics who are working on this material are no different. And so you ask your question how we are going to bring from this level of investment, of this level of manpower to consumer products. On the other hand, there is an industry, and this industry, during the last okay, 30, 40 years, rationalized itself uh, uh, in response to demand of uh, its uh, shareholders. So all research or any research which is free uh, or more years further down the line, okay, was cut, cut by, uh, by a bit. So take IBM, Bell Labs, or any big company, they cut Philips, uh, they cut their research quarters to the bone, and uh, nothing is left. A new CEO comes in and immediately shareholders vote, okay, he he going he going to cut off all this research division, shares shoot up, but it's a very short uh, term prospect. Okay, you you win within the next maybe ten years, but then what we get People at at industry, they are not able to take those inventions which are coming from academia. The gap grows bigger and bigger. Okay. We are talking with Professor Andre Geim, who won the 2010 Nobel Prize in Physics related to his work in graphene. We've been discussing the question of whether work that's done in the academic world can, can and how it gets applied to the industrial world. It actually seems that we are at loggerheads because the industri the industrial world is at the end of the day is looking mostly at costs and the academic world really doesn't seem to care about costs as much as the other benefits that they you know the the interest or the prestige how can you suggest bringing these two together uh i'm not sure that uh, this is a right assessment i i'm just saying that there is a very long economic chain between okay fundamental discovery or fundamental knowledge and the final consumer product you get quickest profit if you look at the top of this chain which is okay some tinkering with design and uh, improving uh, cutting cost, improving efficiency, and so on, and it can be done within a few years. But eventually, you deplete your bottom line, your fundamental knowledge, and then you get this gap. There is no more supply of uh, disruptive technologies to feed the industry. So, yeah, okay. So this is we, our human nature, looking for short-term profit for rising the share in the share prices, okay, cause this uh, um, this uh, dilemma, okay, this conflict between, okay, fundamental knowledge and consumer products. So the gap uh, getting bigger and bigger. I'm not sure what to do with this, but, okay, the only, currently what's going on, the only chain which, which remains between academia and industry, it's students and postdocs who graduate from, uh, from academia, start up their small companies, grow uh, organically into slightly bigger companies, then devoured by bigger companies, and then devoured by the companies in which you keep your shares. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that ultimately it requires some sort of government intervention because they're the, the biggest ones out there. In other words, man never would have made it to the moon if the government didn't pay for it. Yes, I, I think so, but the situation is even worse than it was during that time. At that time, there was a public pressure on the government uh, to keep yeah, technologically advance all those agencies like uh, the moon agency, DARPA, okay, were created 
as a competition, okay, at the moment, okay, there is no public pressure on the government, while companies, industry experience a lot of pressure from shareholders to keep the profits up. So that's, uh, that's okay, we probably need, okay, sort of change in mentality and a little bit change in, in government's perception of what the industry can or cannot deliver and what academia can deliver or not. I think it's also the way you describe it has to do with how long term someone's willing to invest. You know, my day job is that I'm a financial advisor. So I talk to clients about being long term investors. And sometimes they're thinking, well, Doug, do you mean six months? And I'm thinking, no, I mean 20 years. So, <laughs> yeah, and sometimes even 40 years, but you wouldn't find many, <laughs> many, many, no one would take your financial advice because it's probably extends over the lifetime. So <laughs> it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult situation and uh, it's, it goes on all, on all sorts of levels and essentially we, we live in a pretty safe world these days, okay? Yeah, of course not Israel. This is why there is a lot of investment, uh, uh, in, investment in Israel in something which is uh, relevant to security. But otherwise, okay, it's pretty safe world and we are not ready to invest into sort of prospects which are coming in uh, in 20 40 years and in addition to that uh, the young generations of phd students and uh, postdocs in the west okay israel excluding okay feel their uh, themselves so safe they are prepared to they inspire no more than to become a middle managers bankers <laughs> in the bad uh, sense of these words or professionally unemployed so this is also kind of uh, I have many students and they certainly do not uh, do not I don't know any one of them who ever inspired to become rich to start okay a company and uh, really get rich I, I my students started around five probably four five uh, companies which are still in the existence and they run them on sort of on home base okay they do not want to expand okay they feel so much safe in this okay one man company or two man company and so on so there is no drive anymore okay we are too secure these days wow well that's that's a depressing note it is. It, it is. This is why why you see my uh, my logo, okay, my photograph like that on my Skype, okay. Kill yourself, save the planet. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. Well, listen, we uh, we are going to have to hope that that people get a little more driven so that they can come up with uh, amazing discoveries and inventions like you have. We've been talking to Andre Geim who won the 2010 Nobel Prize in Physics. We've been talking a lot today about the, the, the gap between academic and industry. If you want to learn more about the original work that he had done, we spoke about that on the first time that he was on the Goldstein on Gelt show. So you can just look at the archives, go to goldsteinongelt.com or simply go to YouTube and look up Goldstein on Gelt to find that. Andre, in the last few seconds, can you just tell people how is the best way for them to follow the work that you are doing? I guess, okay, it's just Google for uh, word graphene and you'll find, okay, several companies which, which uh, from Samsung to Nokia to uh, smaller companies like Graphene Industries or Bluestone companies which, which has nice web pages which show what sort of possibilities are open for us. So despite all the pessimism, how bad it is, this area is still moving very fast and maybe this is one of those few examples where fundamental knowledge comes not in uh, 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 40 years or 20 years, but maybe 10, 15 into some consumer products. Okay, I think I could wait for that. Andre Geim, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, it was a pleasure. Thank you. You've been listening to the Goldstein on Gelt Show with money maven Doug Goldstein. Doug's weekly radio show is heard around the world, but if you miss it, you can download the podcast at www.goldsteinongelt.com. The Goldstein on Gelt Show gives you up-to-date financial ideas so you can get on the path to financial freedom. If you'd like your questions answered on the air or off, 
Send Doug an email to Doug at Profile-Financial.com. It's your money for your future, so join Doug every week to build your wealth on the Goldstein on Gelt Show.